Right, so in this video, we're going to look at the cerebral cortex. So we just looked at the deep structures of the cerebrum, the basal ganglia and the limbic system, and the overall structure in, of the cerebrum into hemispheres. Now we'll look at the outermost layers and their uh, differentiation. So the cerebral cortex, again, is the outer layer of the cerebrum. Really, this is the place where we associate our conscious mental activities with. So it's a key, it plays a key role in attention, perception, awareness, and thought, memory, language, consciousness. Uh, there are key sensory, motor, and association areas all throughout the cortex. And uh, again, we can separate the cerebral cortex via the longitudinal fissure into two hemispheres, right and left. They're connected by the corpus callosum and they're highly folded into the gyri and the sulci. The average thickness of the cerebral cortex is only about two to four millimeters. So all of your conscious activities really occur in that two to four millimeter layer of cells. But remember that the gray matter in this area contains about 75% of the cell bodies of all the neurons in the body are found in the cortex. We divide the cortex into lobes, as previously mentioned in the last video, a frontal lobe uh, here, a parietal lobe, we have an occipital lobe at the back, and then temporal lobe, and then deep down again we have the insula if we peel away the temporal lobe. And then we can think of the limbic lobe, as I mentioned in the last video, as the inner lining of the cerebrum um, that kind of wraps around the ventricles, uh, wraps around the corpus callosum and whatnot, and that is sometimes considered a lobe as well. But usually these are the four lobes that we can see from the surface. Um, there are, again, many uh, sulci that divide the lobes. So the lobes are divided by specific sulci. So we have the central sulcus, which divides up here, which divides the frontal from the parietal lobe. There's a lateral fissure here, uh, which divides the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe and um, there's a parietal occipital sulcus back here and a pre-occipital notch right here. So that's one way we can anatomically visualize these different lobes. Um, okay, so again, this is a very thin layer of cells. Uh, there's about 14 to 16 billion neurons though in the cerebral cortex and it's divided into six layers and uh, they're also divided into columns. And uh, each column in each cortical area actually has very specific function. So this, this has been very highly mapped in primates and in humans and whatnot. But here's an example of the different layers of the cerebral cortex. So the outermost layer here, I'll draw that in red uh, right here, um, is actually going to be, a, we have pia mater, of course, right here. And then between the pia and the arachnoid, there is CSF that's going to flow through here. So we might think of the outermost layer as actually being, and it's very interesting if you look at the neurons here, their dendrites are oriented towards the surface of the pia, almost like little antennas. And it's as if they're receiving impulses and information from the CSF, which is a very ancient view. In uh, ancient Greece, for instance, it was thought that the brain matter itself wasn't the seat of consciousness, that the uh, fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid, really was involved in uh, where we receive our thoughts, and then um, you know the brain itself picks up that reception and carries it forward. So that's kind of interesting in just how these neurons are oriented. So we have all these uh, neurons with their dendrites just hanging out there, um, just under the surface of the pia, and then they extend uh, extensions down. They synapse synapse onto other neurons, and we see in particular in the area that's going to be known as the motor cortex, which we'll look at here shortly. They're very large cells, they look pyramid shape, and they're called pyramidal cells. So this is where when you hear things like the pyramidal tract and so forth, their cell bodies of that tract originate up here in the uh, cerebral cortex, and then they send extensions down. And this is gonna go down that internal capsule we talked about in the previous video, and then that'll interact with the basal ganglia, and then that'll go down to the brainstem, spinal cord, and out to the body. So this is um, a little drawing of those, those six layers here in the cerebrum. Now, importantly, the, remember the blood supply for the brain comes, most of it comes from the circle of Willis, and that's where the vertebral and the internal carotid arteries meet. Um, and then from the circle of Willis, there are three major branches, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral artery. And they each um, send blood to different areas of the brain. So if you look at the picture to the right here, the front part of the brain, 
is uh, perfused by the anterior cerebral artery. Now, unfortunately, and I'll show you in pictures coming up here, if you look on the, remember the um, median longitudinal, uh, the longitudinal fissure separates the cerebrum into right and left hemispheres. If you cut the brain in half and look at the inside of the fissure, the anterior cerebral artery perfuses most of that area as well. Again, I'll show you a picture of that. That's important because the motor and sensory areas actually are also mapped on the inside area there. And so they're gonna be influenced by anything that might obstruct blood flow to the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, in particular, the areas that map the face and the hands and whatnot are all perfused by the anterior cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery perfuses this middle area here. And again, we'll see on the motor and sensory areas, which we can kind of represent here, um, that uh, the areas representing the legs and uh, torso and all that are perfused by the middle cerebral artery. And then the posterior cerebral artery perfuses the back of the brain and is part of the temporal lobe. And so occlusions to the posterior cerebral artery might result, for example, in visual deficits because this area back here in the occipital lobe is your primary visual center. Um, so this is, we'll see in the neurology section with different strokes affecting different parts of the blood supply of the brain, we can get different uh, loss of different neurological function. So again, we'll be coming back to that in just a moment. Okay, so let's start looking at the different lobes in the cortex. So the first one is gonna be the frontal lobe, and that's the area just above the eyes behind the forehead. And um, that is depicted in this particular picture in green. Um, so that's actually all of, everything is colored here as a frontal lobe. The uh, prefrontal cortex is the front part of that, and uh, that's depicted in green. And then we have different areas. So you see this big red band coming down through here. This is known as the primary motor cortex. And this is where uh, we have cells. When they fire, they're going to, via the projections that go down to the brainstem and out to the spinal cord, they're going to regulate all the muscles in the body, uh, specifically voluntary muscle control. So that's uh, what the primary motor cortex does there is what's called the premotor area right in front of it. And the premotor area or supplementary motor cortex, we can think of that as a supplementary motor processing station that's gonna help the primary motor cortex in its activity. <clears throat> and then there's a very specific area called the frontal eye fields that are gonna regulate eye movement. And then finally, there's an area called the Broca's area, um, which is gonna be involved in speech. So with Broca's area, this is what regulates the muscles of articulation. So if you have a lesion, again, uh, maybe a blockage of blood supply to the Broca's area, then what would happen is you would tend to get problems in uh, difficulty in enunciating speech. So you get what's called non-fluent aphasia. You, you know what you want to say, you have cognition of what you want to say, but you can't say it. The muscles just don't work. Um, so that's what lesions to Broca's area does. Uh, if you look at the blood supply, again, we already saw the um, sagittal view from the outside. So the anterior cerebral artery kind of is what is perfusing the prefrontal area. And then the middle cerebral artery is perfusing some of the motor cortex. Um, and then if you look on the, again, cut the brain in half, go down that fissure, we see that the anterior cerebral artery perfuses most of that medial area. So that's gonna be important because the primary motor cortex actually goes up and it wraps down. It's gonna wrap around, so it starts here and it's gonna wrap around down here. And so different areas of the body are mapped to different regions of this motor cortex. So that's where, depending on if it's a lesion of the anterior or the posterior cerebral artery, we're gonna get different uh, motor deficits, like say after a stroke. Okay, so again, prefrontal cortex, this is the area. Uh, above the eyes, it's the front part of the frontal cortex. This is often the area we, we call our executive center. So all of our higher brain functions in a way, and I spoke about this at the very beginning of the brain section, uh, all of our brain functions in a way are ultimately regulated, we think, by this area, the prefrontal cortex. So it's kind of like what, uh, it's the emperor in a way that sort of controls all the other parts of the limbic system and whatnot. Um, we think this is the area that helps us filter impulsivity and impulsive thoughts. And uh, there's a very famous example of a person who had damaged the prefrontal cortex and uh, apparently it dramatically changed his behavior. And that's Phineas Gage. 
uh, Phineas Gage with an, was a 19th century railroad engineer, uh, I believe in New Hampshire or Maine, and he was uh, packing explosives into the ground with a metal rod to blast away some rock to make a railroad bed. And as he was packing the explosives down, they went off and the rod projected through his jaw and completely went through his prefrontal cortex and uh, behind his eyes. And uh, he basically had loss of complete function on one side of his frontal cortex. The doctor who examined him actually could see, looking from the top of the skull, look all the way through and could see through his skull down through his jaw. Uh, miraculously, he lived and um, they were able to seal up both ends basically and he was able to live, but he had loss of that prefrontal cortex function. And before the accident, he had been known as a very dependable, hardworking, uh, very calm kind of person. And uh, after that, apparently, he was very subject to violent rages and impulsivity and so forth. There's a lot of debate about his case because the, the testimonials are so varied. Um, but I think there's, um, since that time, there's been a lot of evidence looking at the role of the prefrontal cortex in helping to regulate all of our other brain functions. Um, again, the premotor and motor, primary motor cortex, these are going to um, send uh, neural information down different pathways. And we've already seen two of them, and that was the cortical spinal and cortical bulbar tracts. So the cortical spinal tract is going to send motor information from the primary motor cortex down the spinal, down into the brainstem, down the spinal cord, um, and that will come out through your ventral nerve roots, and that will innervate your muscles, your voluntary muscles. So that's the cortical spinal tract. Remember, cortical bulbar goes down to the brainstem, and that's what uh, innervates your um, cranial nerves. So the, the nerves that uh, control the muscles of the face and the tongue and the shoulders and so forth are innervated by the cranial uh, cortical bulbar tract. So if you look at the, um, from a coronal section of the brain, look at the motor area, we actually see that different areas are mapped um, differently. So if you look at the lateral side of the brain, we can see here that the face, for example, has a lot of nerves associated with it. So nerves firing, or if you trigger nerves to fire in these regions, you would start to see things like facial muscles moving, the lips moving, eyelids, things like that. Uh, versus we have a hand area here, kind of in the middle. And then notice as the motor cortex drapes around down that medial fissure, the longitudinal fissure, um, this is where we have the leg, the foot, and the leg, and the knee areas. So again, this area, I'll draw it in blue, this area is primarily innovate, uh, perfused by the anterior cerebral artery, and this area is perfused primarily by the, post, by the middle cerebral artery. So depending on where lesions are in those arteries, if you have an occlusion, you're going to get loss maybe of lower limb function, but still have upper limb um, and face activity, and vice versa. Uh, notice these areas, uh, some are bigger than the others, so the face has a lot of motor neurons uh, connected with it, so does the hand. And in fact, as you practice different activities like piano or, or guitar or something like that, or knitting or whatever it is, you actually grow and expand the neural uh, connectivity in those areas. So these maps are not written in, uh, they're not solid, they're, they're morphing, and they change depending on your activities. So learning uh, an instrument and so forth would involve changes in the motor area, uh, for example. Again, when that uh, motor activity becomes unconscious, you don't have to think about it, then the cerebellum is taking over and it's working with a lot of that. Okay, so that is the primary motor area and the motor homunculus. Homunculus means little person. So it's like there's a map of a little person there in the brain along this strip. And again, we're talking just to orient you, we're just talking about this area in red right here, draw it in blue, uh, this area right here. So that motor homunculus is found there. And again, it's draping around the uh, backside there as well, in the middle of the brain. And then there is a motor area on the left hemisphere and there's one on the right hemisphere. And again, on the left hemisphere, it's gonna control the right side of the body. And the motor area on the right hemisphere is going to control the left side of the body. So just keep that orientation in mind. All right, so that's the motor area. Then we have the frontal eye areas, again, just in front there, depicted in yellow up here in the diagram. And uh, this is control of eye movements. So lesions there, 
like from a stroke, you might see problems of the eyes actually drifting downward. They actually will drift towards the side that's injured, towards the hemisphere of the brain where the injury occurs. Um, if we have a seizure in this area, the eyes will drift away typically from the site of the hyperactivity. What a seizure really is, is just sudden, uh, unexplained, uncontrolled nerve activity, neural activity. So all of these neurons just start to discharge in an area. And uh, if that happens to be in the motor cortex, we're going to start to see motor problems. Uh, if it happens in the frontal eye areas, we tend to see the eyes drifting away from the uh, hemisphere in which, if it's happening in the left hemisphere, the eyes would drift towards the right, away from the area where the seizure activity is happening. So that's the frontal eye fields. And then I mentioned Broca's area involved in language production and speech. And uh, that can, lesions to that area can result in what's called non-fluent aphasia, where again, you know what you want to say, but you just can't articulate it. Okay, next we come to the parietal lobe. Um, and that has uh, some interesting areas. This, think of the parietal lobe as being your primary area for mapping sensory information from the body. So frontal lobe was motor, this is sensory information. And again, if we look at the uh, perfusion and blood supply, we have both the posterior, really we have all three cerebral arteries supplying different parts of the parietal lobe depending on where it's located. All right, so let's look at some of the major centers here in the parietal lobe. Um, so again, just to orient you, parietal lobe right here. Uh, so it's this area all depicted here. That is the parietal lobe. I think this drawing is a little confusing. They put the sensory and motor areas together, but really they should be separate. So what's in blue actually here is part of the frontal lobe. That's the motor area we just talked about. And then we're going to be talking about what's in red here, which is the sensory, primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe. Uh, and this is where all of the ascending fibers come up from the spinal thalamic tract and the dorsal columns. Remember, we talked about those when we talked about the brainstem. So they're bringing all of the conscious touch and vibration, proprioception, two-point two discrimination information up the spinal thalamic tract, up the spinal cord. And remember, it's going to cross. Um, they're going, fibers from the right side of the body are going to cross in the uh, brainstem. They're going to go to the left side. And so they'll be mapped onto the left hemisphere and the left sensory cortex. And just like we had uh, with the motor area, there's a homunculus here. So this is called the sensory homunculus, very similar to the motor homunculus. So the facial regions are more on the lateral side. And uh, so we have face and lips. Again, hands get a very large uh, portion and then the legs and feet, a little less so. So this explains like why some areas of the body you have very, very fine discrimination. Like if you take two sharp points and you separate them only by a millimeter or two and then put them on your hand, um, let's say on the thenar eminence, you could usually differentiate even a couple of millimeters away uh, that there's two sharp points. But if you did the same thing on your back, you'd have to separate those points by almost a half an inch or more before you started to notice that there are actually two distinct points. So there, the back gets a lot less sensory innervation than areas like the hand in the face. Um, again, this map is morphing, changing a bit. So depending on what kind of activities you use, if you really cultivate your touch and whatnot, then you can actually expand, let's say the hand area and so forth. Um, Okay, so that's the sensory homunculus. Um, so this is uh, the, probably the main thing the parietal lobe is known for. There are a number in the parietal lobe association areas as well, and they are going to associate, for example, visual information. And if you think back to one of our very first lectures on perception, I showed you the visual pathway where light comes into the retinas that goes to the optic nerves. It crosses, the optic nerve crosses right by the uh, thalamus and then uh, the neurons from the retina synapse onto a second order neurons in the, in the thalamus, an area called the lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN. And then from the LGN, um, the neurons are projected back to the occipital cortex. And then from the occipital cortex, nerve pathways uh, carry information up to the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. In the parietal lobe, it really, this information is, is associated with where and how something is happening. So this is one of the areas where we interpret visual information is in the parietal lobe. So not just the occipital lobe, but we have the parietal lobe involved in visual 
association. There's also language processing. It's also an important center for uh, attention, uh, cognitive attention and whatnot. So think of the parietal lobe as really the primary sensory cortex with its homunculus, and then the various association areas for uh, speech, but uh, also cognition. Next, we come to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, and this one's easier. This is your primary visual cortex, as I just talked about. So again, the information pathway is from your retinas. Uh, they cross at the optic chiasm. Then they go to the lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN, and the thalamus, where they synapse onto other neurons, which then map the information back to the primary uh, visual cortex. And um, so that's the uh, main thing that occipital lobe is known for. Notice that the primary blood supply there is gonna be the posterior cerebral artery. So posterior cerebral artery lesions would result in visual deficits. There's also some visual association areas and uh, we can get all sorts of problems with lesions here. Uh, again, in vision, usually it's a loss of the visual field on either the right or the left side of the vertical midline. That's called homonym homonymous hemianopsia. Um, there's also visual agnosia. That's the inability to recognize objects. So you can see them, but you don't know what they are. And then alexia without agraphia is the inability to read uh, with the ability to write. Um, and so that also can result from lesions in the occipital lobe. Uh, there is something known as occipital epilepsy. Epilepsy is just a generalized name for seizure activity. So when there's excess neural activity in the occipital lobe, this is fairly rare, but one can get very distinct visual hallucinations. And that can be triggered by bright or flashing lights. And some might dismiss, uh, misdiagnose that as migraine. Uh, migraine also affects the occipital lobe, but not uh, the same way as an epilepsy. Um, it's very rare, but this can be a rare cause of very strange visual hallucinations. There's no pain or anything. It's just uh, hallucinations. So that's the uh, occipital lobe. Think of that just primarily tied in with the primary visual cortex. Finally, we'll come here to the temporal lobe. There's several different functions here. Uh, so the temporal lobe is this part here, the temples. And um, we have primarily in the temporal lobe, the area for hearing. So what's called the auditory association and the primary auditory centers. So this is where all of your sound information that you hear is mapped. Um, so the auditory pathway really starts with the cochlea in the ear. That's the structure in the inner ear, which receives uh, pressure waves from sound, converts that into nerve impulses, and then conveys that via cranial nerve number eight which then uh, remember that is going to actually go back to the medulla to cochlear nuclei there. And then from there, uh, fibers will actually cross between the right and the left side of the body. And then that'll travel up its own pathway, lateral meniscus tract, and that'll synapse with another area in the thalamus called the medial geniculate nucleus. And then that's mapped into the primary auditory cortex. So complex pathway, again, you don't need to memorize that, but know that auditory information goes to the brainstem, then goes up to the thalamus. Usually it's gonna cross, so uh, sound information coming in from the left side of the body. Uh, left ear will cross over and be mapped into the right temporal lobe and vice versa. And uh, so that's uh, the auditory uh, area, so primary and association area. Another big area in the temporal lobe, kind of extends it in the parietal lobe a little bit, is uh, what's called Wernicke's area and that's depicted here. And Wernicke's is your language comprehension area. So people with deficits in Wernicke's area actually can speak, the Broca's area is fine, they have the motor muscles to move their tongue in their mouth and whatnot, um, but they actually, their speech has no meaning. So we often call that word salad. They just throw various words, dog, hat, I once on the mountain, you know, all together in a sentence, and you're like, what are you talking about? So that's uh, damage to Wernicke's area, and that's called fluent aphasia when that happens. Um, so that's the uh, Wernicke's area. Deep down in the temporal lobe, that's where we have the hippocampus. So we already talked about the hippocampus, uh, and that's really where we're consolidating short-term into long-term memories. And then the memories are stored elsewhere. And that's a really fascinating subject, is how memory is stored in the body. It, you know, we previously thought it was localized just in the hippocampus, uh, 
And then uh, some very famous experiments showed that actually memory is a global phenomena throughout the brain. So memory is stored all throughout the brain. And now we're beginning to think that memory is actually a global body phenomena where memory can be stored in muscle. And that's this idea of muscle memory being triggered. If you get a massage or something, it should bring up a memory for you. Uh, so that's something that's still being explored. Um, but the hippocampus we can think of as the main integrating area that's gonna consolidate short into long-term memories. Clear evidence that hippocampal lesions and strokes and whatnot uh, result in severe uh, memory issues. Uh, there's something called the Popes circuit, which is really part of the limbic system, ties in with the brainstem. And uh, this is used in the emotion and memory pathway. So uh, hippocampus is, is involved in that. Okay, um, also with the temporal lobe, there's, uh, we have uh, you know, the limbic system, which is on the deep side, the underside. And uh, the amygdala was one of the aspects we saw there. And so that's also connected here with the um, uh, temporal lobe. Uh, so lesions here in the amygdala in particular, Interestingly, this is called Kluver-Busey syndrome. And Kluver-Busey, um, this was done, uh, unfortunately, in primates where they, they lesioned off the uh, amygdala and they found several things. One is that um, you, people get what's called psychic blindness. They actually um, can't see clearly. Um, I mean, what they're seeing, they actually forget and they, they can't recognize anymore. Um, they also have very severe personality changes, uh, specifically abnormal docility, so very docile. They have hyperorality. They put everything into their mouth that's in sight. And then uh, they're hypersexual uh, and they lose preference for what they're mating with. They'll mount, so when this was done in primates, they were mounting anything in the vicinity. So both the primate studies, but also histories of people with strokes in these areas have all sort of brought awareness of the importance of the amygdala in these deep temporal structures uh, in emotional responses. So this is specifically Kluver Busi. Um, and then finally, there is something known as temporal lobe epilepsy. So again, this would be abnormal seizure activity, abnormal neural activity in this region. And uh, this is often associated with very vivid hallucinations. Sometimes people hear things. Um, and uh, this is actually a common or originating point for uh, more severe forms of epilepsy. So for example, grand mal seizures are where the entire brain starts to fire abnormally. And we'll look at all the different types of seizure types in the neurology section. But in, uh, in particular, temporal, epi temporal lobe epilepsy has been sometimes associated with, uh, you know, there's some discussion in the neurology community uh, looking again from a materialistic angle, saying that this is kind of our God center. When people say they hear the voice of God and they have all these uh, impulses, a very interesting uh, person we think who had temporal lobe epilepsy was Dostoevsky, the writer. Um, and he talks about his experiences where out of the blue, he'll hear these voices, he'll see these images, and they're often uh, giving him different insights and inspiration but they're sort of coming at him unwilled. Um, and then he would just kind of note, he learned over the years to sort of work with them. And uh, they were, again, often a source of inspiration for him. But uh, many people who claim they hear the voice of God and so forth, the neurological community would say, well, you probably very well have temporal lobe epilepsy. And they could do different tests like ECG and whatnot, uh, I'm sorry, EEG, electroencephalogram, uh, to measure your brain waves and uh, to confirm that diagnosis. Uh, we'll look at the EEG here in the next few lectures. All right, so that's the uh, major aspects of the temporal lobe. So just to kind of summarize, again, we can think of the cerebral cortex with uh, sensory areas, motor areas, and then association areas. So let's just uh, review again the sensory areas. So again, in the parietal lobe, we have the primary somatosensory cortex, and that is really the sensory input from all your receptors in your skin and skeletal muscles. Uh, and we have the sensory homunculus we already went through here and uh, really functions in the sensation of temperature, touch, pressure, vibration, pain, uh, and uh, proprioception. Um, so that's uh, the somatosen primary somatosensory cortex. Now the thalamus, remember, also receives sensory input. And we can think of the thalamus as more subconscious or visceral kind of sensation. So more dull pain, pain that's not easily localizable, uh, general malaise, general sensations. We, those are usually associated with thalamic or deep cortical structures. 
uh, where the sensory input, uh, inputs are mapped onto. Uh, the primary somatosensory area is more your conscious, uh, more fully aware, I feel pain here, I feel this sensation here. Uh, that's all coming from the somatosensory area. Uh, and then there is the somatosensory association area also in the parietal lobe, which is going to help determine things like shape and texture and orientation of objects, uh, connect that to the memory of past sensory experiences and so forth. Uh, so that's one association area. Another one would be in the occipital lobe, your visual association area. And there is, um, again, two pathways, the so-called dorsal stream, which sends information up to the parietal lobe for further processing and then the ventral stream, which sends it down to the temporal lobe for further, further processing. So we also, we saw already with the parietal lobe, the where and how circuits. In the temporal lobe, there's other um, sort of things that we can associate visual information with, in particular, facial recognition. So this area um, is uh, area associated with facial uh, recognition. So when you look at someone's face, you remember who they are. There are people uh, that actually have, uh, have had a stroke in that area or a lesion in that area, and they can no longer recognize faces. So the famous neurologist, uh, Oliver Sacks, who wrote several interesting, really interesting books um, on different neurological phenomena, um, he actually suffered from that. Prosopagnosia is what it's called, and so people can't actually recognize uh, he couldn't, when he would meet a friend, he didn't recognize that that face belonged to his friend. But he could tell from other features, the sound of the voice maybe, or uh, some other body feature, that it was his friend. So very interesting phenomena. But that's uh, due to lesions here in the temporal lobe. And then we have in the temporal lobe the primary auditory areas. Um, and that's again uh, receiving our hearing information and then associating that with the auditory association area. And that's going to analyze sound for recognition of tone, speech, and music, things like that. And then we mentioned Wernicke's area. Uh, this is primarily, it's in both hemispheres, but I should mention that Broca's and Wernicke's, for most right-handed people, and over 90% of individuals actually, both right and left-handed, um, is found mostly in the left temporal lobe. Um, and the Broca's would be in the left uh, frontal lobe. Um, again, there's some overlap into the parietal lobe is here as well. And this is where we interpret the meaning of speech and we recognize the meaning of spoken words. So uh, damage to this area um, can result in that fluent aphasia where people can speak but their speech is meaningless. Um, the right hemispheric Wernicke's area uh, we think adds additional emotional content to what's heard but um, the primary area is on the left. So think of left hemisphere is the primary area for Wernicke's area in most people. There's also an area I didn't talk about in the parietal lobe called the gustatory area. This is where we receive our taste information. So the taste buds and all their information is mapped into the parietal lobe. And then there is a primary olfactory area also in the temporal lobe on the medial side. This is part of the limbic system, remember. And um, that is what is helping us with our smell and to associate different smells with different memories or at least to recognize maybe what a smell is. Um, it's tied in uh, via the limbic system to the prefrontal cortex and so forth. So there's another area called the orbital frontal cortex, which is our association area for odors. So again, it can get very detailed, but just kind of think about how each of these lobes has its each specific sensory center and uh, has very specific uh, functions that it's participating in. Let's just quickly review all the primary motor areas we talked about. So we just looked at sensory. Again, our primary motor cortex is in the um, posterior part of the frontal lobe. Uh, so if you look down at this picture here, this sort of sagittal view, in the red we have the primary motor cortex. And then in the parietal lobe right next to it, we have the primary somatosensory cortex. So they're right next to each other. And again, each has its own homunculus. Um, and the face and tongue and hand areas are more on the lateral side. And then the foot, knee, and thigh, hip areas are more on the medial side. And they wrap down uh, via the, uh, the longitudinal fissure. Um, and the remember, the both the right primary motor and primary somatosensory area are either controlling or sensing the left side of the body and vice versa. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have the premotor cortex we saw in front of that. It's not depicted in the diagram, but that was right up here. And then uh, the frontal eye field areas right here, uh, which regulate your eye movement. And then Broca's speech area, which is primarily in the left hemisphere again, uh, in about 97% of the population. Um, and this is what controls the muscles of articulation. So lesions to Broca's area, again, result in non-fluent aphasia. Aphasia just means a speech deficit, so non-fluent, you can't speak. Um, okay, so that's some of the primary motor areas. Uh, also the prefrontal cortex, which again, this is part of our executive brain, and it has a number of interconnections with the limbic system, uh, thalamus, all these different regions. And so we think this is again involved in our higher cognition, our reasoning, our higher intelligence, complex learning abilities, judgment, and so forth. And uh, the example of Phineas Gage, where we had the destruction of the prefrontal cortex and the chain, dramatic change in behavior after that. Um, okay, so that's the prefrontal area. So that's the summary of some of the major motor areas in the brain. Um, so notice that most of the hemisphere or the lobes are associated with sensory activities, but the motor activities are more uh, localized to specific areas. So for the most part, the two hemispheres, left and right in the brain, um, are mostly similar, but there are very subtle anatomic and physiologic differences. Um, I've already talked about Wernicke's area. About two-thirds of people have a Wernicke's area that's about 50% larger on the left than on the right. Uh, remember that most people, 97%, have a Broca's area only on the left, etc. So you can see some uh, different concentrations of neurons, different interconnectivity, if you compare right and left hemispheres in people. Um, in most people, and again, there's a lot of crossover here, the left hemisphere is associated with more our, uh, our logical, analytical reasoning skills. So the, we might say that's more earth-based thinking, uh, a spoken and written language, the ability to understand things like sign language, uh, left brain injuries, again, Broca's, Wernicke's area, whatnot, result in the different aphasias. So that's left hemisphere, our more earth-based hemisphere. Right hemisphere, we associate that more with artistic, creative, fluid thinking. So that would be more maybe water, air, fire type of cognition. Um, and that's musical artistic awareness, spatial and pattern recognition, uh, recognition of faces and emotional content of language. Again, that might involve the right Wernicke's area to some degree. Uh, discrimination of different smells and taste, generating mental images and so forth. Um, so that's the right brain. Interestingly, people with damage to the right brain areas that correspond to Broca's and Wernicke's, um, uh, that correspond to those areas that are on the left, um, actually speak in a monotonous tone. So it's like they can speak, they still have the left of Wernicke and Broca's area, but if you damage the right sides, uh, they lose the emotional content and the ability to really put emotion in what they're saying. Uh, so that's uh, some of the, the differences. There's considerable crossover, and so this is where this is a bit of a controversial thing now. We don't really say that it's that clear that the left side is just analytical, right side is just more the artistic creative, uh, because there's a lot of crossover. It seems that in females, interestingly, there's less hem uh, lateralization. This seems to occur more in males. So. It's unclear if there are social factors that regulate that, that this is not something hardwired in the nervous system, but it's something maybe that has to do with upbringing and so forth. Uh, but in general, we, we do tend to think of the left hemisphere as more the kind of earth-based thinking, right hemisphere is more the fluidic uh, kind of uh, associative thinking and so forth. Okay, so that's uh, all we really need to know at this point on the cerebral cortex. Again, be familiar with the different lobes be familiar with the general structure of the cortex, the six layers of cells, uh, understand the different motor and sensory areas, and then some of the different association areas that are correlated with that. But again, this is the area kind of of our higher cognition, and uh, especially the prefrontal cortex is helping to regulate all the different brain areas, especially the brain stem and the limbic system for emotional regulation and so forth. All right, so that wraps it up for the cerebral cortex.